come up the stairs carefully here, because although I'm talking about remote viewing, my ordinary viewing is quite poor. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about the work we did at Stanford Research Institute for two decades, which is very relevant to the world of duality and non-locality. Non-locality non is the idea that things are not separate from one another. The first people that I know of who talked about non-locality were the Buddhists at the time, 500 BC in the Prajna Paramita. The Buddhists wrote the idea that separation is an illusion for consciousness. Although Chicago and San Francisco are separated by thousands of miles, in consciousness there's no separation. So the idea of non-duality is very appropriate for what we're seeing. The question is, is there, a, is there a separation or is there a, no separation? The first person I know who wrote about this was Nagarjuna. I don't know if other people have talked to you about him. He's a Buddhist master logician at the time of Christ. And his great writings were about the middle path, the path between reality and illusion. And he said that all your suffering is due to Aristotle. And I'm sure you'll be happy to know that. <clears throat> Aristotle said that a thing could be either true or not true. Aristotle's big separation, Aristotle's big contribution was the idea of the excluded middle. So what he did for logic for 2,000 years is tell you that there is no middle ground. A thing is either true or it's not true. There's no middle ground. What Nargajuna said, on the contrary, most things are neither true nor not true. So, an, uh, hooray for Nargajuna. So he was writing at the, at the time of Christ and he was a logician and for, as a physicist, I'm, a, I'm really a laser, laser guy. My, my before and after my mid-course correction with psychic stuff, I was working with lasers. I was a pioneer in the development of the laser. And then my last decade and a half, I was putting lasers on airplanes looking for invisible wind shear. So I spent a lot of time looking for things that can't be seen. And in the laser world, um, the, element, the beginning physicist wants to know, well, is light a wave or is it a particle? Uh, when light goes through a prism, it behaves 100% like a wave. It spreads out, looks like a spectrum. It's perfectly wave-like. When light goes into a photo counter and you're counting photons, you can count them click, 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 and behave 100% like a particle. So a student reasonably says, well, what is this thing? Is light a wave and a particle? And the answer is no, because when it's behaving like a wave, there is no particle manifestation at all. When it's behaving like a particle, there is no wave essence showing at all. So Nargajuna would say that light is neither a wave nor not a wave. So he was one of the very first people, certainly the first person I know of, who was fascinated and uh, overcome for his lifetime with the idea of non-duality. Non so he was the first non-dual writer uh, that I know of. There may have been earlier Greeks. The, the Greeks were overcome by Aristotle. So they said there, is, there is no middle ground, whereas Nargajuna said almost everything is in, in the middle ground. So one of the great progenitors of this conference is Nargajuna writing at the time of Christ. And he's uh, revered in the Buddhist tradition. In the work that we did at SRI, we followed this idea that things may be separated on the map or by the railroad trains. New York and Chicago may be a thousand miles away, but if a lover says, there is no separation between me and my sweetheart, I'm in California, she's in New York, as the railroad train goes, it's 3,000 miles, but between us, there's no separation. I can see her, I know what she's doing. There is no separation in consciousness, and that's the correct answer. There's 3,000 miles by railroad train, no separation in consciousness. 
And the most remarkable thing that we were able to do is to get the CIA to let us study that for 20 years. <laughs> we did a lot of other remarkable things, but the fact that we had 20 years of un uninterrupted support investigating the nature of psychic abilities, remote viewing, and consciousness, that was one of our big accomplishments. So uh, the remote viewing program went on for 23 years. We were given about uh, $25 million to do that. And in the first decade, we did a lot of remarkable things because we had remarkable people to work with. So this is, uh, what, what, we were, this is what we were doing 40 years ago. So this is Hal Putoff on the left. There's another laser physicist, just like me. We're both well-known at the time for being laser scientists. The guy in the sunglasses, of course, is a CIA contract monitor. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm unchanged from 40 years ago. And the guy with the funny hat is the most psychic man in the world named Pat Price. So here's Pat working with an ESP teaching machine. I got the program started by showing Werner von Braun a mechanical ESP teaching machine at a conference on speculative technology where I was invited to talk about American and Russian psychic stuff because there was no ESP program in America. Von Braun was prodigiously successful with my ESP game he took me up to meet uh, the administrator of NASA, and that was the first money that we got to start a program at SRI. Because Edgar Mitchell, because, excuse me, because Werner von Braun, you see, get these uh, space people all confused. Uh, Werner von Braun was so psychic and had a psychic grandmother, uh, they decided to support us. So one of the first trials we did, all the things I'm going to be showing you are picture pairs in which I would sit in the laboratory. I'm the stay-at-home guy, a kind of psychic travel agent. So I would sit with the psychic du jour and say, hell, put off, or your contract monitor, or the colonel, or some other lofty person has been taken away to hide. I have no idea where he is. I want you to quiet your mind and describe what it looks like, where he is, what are you experiencing with regard to where he is. So the key words, the shibboleth, the magic words are, tell me what you're experiencing. What are the surprising images that appear in your awareness pertaining to where he has gone? You don't have to go there with your mind. This is not necessarily an out-of-body experience. Look in your awareness and tell me what you see that's surprising. That's all you have to do. So when I do this with a big audience and I'm showing them how to be psychic, I have astonishingly great success because I'm asking them always to do something which is doable, that is, quiet your mind and tell me what you're experiencing. Everybody can do that. So in this case, I'm sitting with Pat Price in a little shielded room, and I say, Hal Putoff and Kit Green have gone to hide somewhere. This is the beginning of a formal series that we published. And uh, I think I both can't see and can't reach what I'm... That, that's not so good. Uh, so on, on... On this side, you have the drawing that uh, Pat Price made. He said, I see a circular body of water about 100 feet in diameter. There's a rectangular body that's about 68 by 75, the little concrete building. And where they're hiding is a swimming pool complex in Palo Alto. The round body of water is 110 feet in diameter. The swimming pool is 75 by 100. And there is a little building there, just as he drew it. So this is viewed se seven miles away from where we were in our shielded room, and he drew the thing to about 95% accuracy from his mental process. He thought it was a water purification plant and drew these water tanks, which are, of course, not there. But we learned 10 years later 
that in the 1930s, this had been a water purification plant. The water tanks were right here, and the tallest thing in the city of Palo Alto were the water tanks that Pat Price drew. So what I've learned since then, that you have to tell people, tell me what's going on at that location at this time. Because what it looks like he did is move his consciousness seven miles south of Middlefield Road and 30 miles backwards on the timeline. We did nine experiments with him, of which seven of them were matched first place. That is to say, if Hal Putoff had been kidnapped by terrorists nine days in a row, Pat Price would have been able to draw a picture and name that place seven out of the nine times. Uh, highly significant, and that was good for another year of support from the, the CIA. They decided that, they decided that we're, we may be onto something. And their first task from the CIA was to describe what's going on at some geographical coordinates. Close your eyes and tell me what you see at these coordinates. And Pat Price said, I see a giant crane. I'm lying on a building and this big crane is rolling back and forth over my body. This is the biggest crane I've ever seen. It's got eight wheels, four on either side of the building. And then he made this quite accurate sketch as I sat with him in the little room. We then brought those down, brought the drawings down to the CIA in the basement. And he said, it looks like you're looking at the right place. Here's a drawing of what a satellite photograph looks like. Here's the photograph of the eight-wheel crane you're talking about. And here's your drawing. That's a pretty good match. But what we'd really like to know is what are they doing inside the building? So next day, Price and I were sitting in our shielded room. And he said, I see that they're making a giant sphere, a 60-foot sphere. And they're making it out of orange peel slices that he called gores. And this was a drawing that he gave us, and this is what we passed on to the CIA. But they couldn't confirm it because it was not, under, not known at that time. Three years later, Aviation Week wrote an article about the giant spheres at Semipalatinsk. And here the 60-foot sphere that Price was talking about, entirely unknown at the time that he gave these drawings. So this got everyone very excited. This, they, each time we do something like this, they say, you, you may be onto something. <laughs> In one of our experiments, Pat Price was describing each day where Hal Putoff was hiding in Colombia and South America. Hal was there on a pleasure and business trip, and Price would say on the first day, I see a church, or I see a volcano, or a market, or a harbor, and then on day five, he didn't show up. So in the spirit of the show must go on, I said, I'll do it. I'd never done a remote viewing before. And I said, it looks to me like an airport on an island. And I see an airport building on the left, and there's sand and grass on the right. And I wrote ocean at the end of the runway. And this is a photograph of what the place looked like on San Andreas Island, which most people thought was really quite a good match. So the really great thing we learned from this is that remote viewing is so easy that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> so this was my very, very first remote viewing, no, no practice at all. And I was describing this to a cab driver recently, and he said, you know, I used to live on San Andreas Island, talking about coincidences, and I have a photograph of it on my cell phone, and here you are. So here is a contemporary picture of the airport that I drew with ocean at the end of the runway. There's the runway, and there's the airport building on the left where I put it. So it's not so hard to do. That all took me 10 minutes after I realized that Price was not coming. Finally, the, I escaped from my little shielded room, and I was sent traveling across the United States. No one knew where I was. And the first place I went was New Orleans, and I randomly chose one picture out of a picture book by scientifically throwing a die on the pavement. The die took me to this remarkable New Orleans Superdome. And I stood there. 
And unfortunately, what I said is that I'm by the New Orleans Superdome is noon, and it's shining like a great UFO in the noonday sun. Bad thing to say. My friend Gary Langford, another physicist, was in the shielded room as a subject. Elizabeth Rauscher, another physicist. See, all this parapsychology is not done by psychology. All of what I'm describing is done by physicists. So uh, what Gary said, as I see this thing, it looks like a flying saucer. Do you think Russell's been abducted? <laughs> so Elizabeth said, just make a drawing of what you see, and I'm sure it'll be all right. So here's his drawing that greatly matches uh, the photograph that I had from the place. So I'm showing you this to give you an I idea that remote viewing is not hard to do, and it can be very accurate. So people, so people who criticize and say, well, remote viewing is a fragile, not reliable ability. In our laboratory, it was extremely reliable and very robust. So remote viewing is a strong, accurate ability. It's not a weak, unreliable ability. Here's Hella Hammond. After working with Ingo Swan, who taught us about remote viewing, he's a New York artist and prodigious remote viewer, and we worked with him and Pat Price, and the CIA said, can you find somebody as a control, find somebody who has not done this before? And I said, well, my friend Hella Hammond has always been interested in the work I'm doing, but she's never done anything like that, and she's met, moved to California professional photographer, shooting for Life magazine, Hella would be happy to work with us. She promises me she's never done this before. So here's Hella and Ingo Swan, my office at SRI. It's a true odd couple. The psych psychics are lovely people, but they have spacious abilities and also spacious egos, so you don't want to try and squash them too close together. We thought it would be a good idea to save money to have them set up housekeeping together while they're working for us. That was one of our not good ideas. <laughs> so our first experiment with Hella, she said, okay, here I am, what do I do? My other viewers had been experienced, so I had to tell Hella, to just quiet your mind and tell me what you're experiencing. She made two little drawings and said, if you stand where Hal is standing, you see squares within squares within squares, and that's indeed what you would see as the pedestrian overpass crossing Bayshore Freeway. And we again did uh, nine trials with her. Even though Hella was our control subject, her work was even more significant than Pat Price's, approaching one in a million. And that's because she only told us exactly what she was confident of. So although she had fewer first place matches, everything she did was essentially correct. And what, she, what we found with Hella is that she was able to describe things in the future just as well as contemporaneous. So one day we decided to do, one week we're doing four precognitive trials to publish in the Proceedings of the Engineering Society, and one typical of the four, because all four were perfectly successful. She said, I see Hal walking into a black triangle, which is right here, and she said, uh, there's something going on like a piston. I hear it squeak, 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 like an unoiled piston. And he came back with his tape recorder. Indeed, the piston is squeaking as he was there. And the thing to realize is that she had completely given her description. By 10 o'clock, she was done, and we had gone away for coffee. Hal had then chosen randomly where to go in his car and went there. So Hal had completed her description an hour before Hal had been assigned his traveling orders. <clears throat> so the thing that the most important thing to take from my talk is that in remote viewing, the accuracy and reliability is independent of the distance. It's just as easy to describe something going on in Soviet Siberia, like the crane of Pat Price. That works just as well 
is describing something across the street in Palo Alto. There is no degradation at all from going 10,000 miles away compared with across the street. The other surprising result is that it's no harder to look hours or weeks into the future than it is to do something contemporaneous. Hello's descriptions that we published looking an hour in advance are exactly as good as the things that we did contemporaneous. So time and space don't exist for remote viewing. Remote viewing is a non-dual ability. There's distance in the world, but in consciousness there's no separation. So telling you about this non-local, non-dual phenomena, it's non-dual in the sense that there is neither a separation nor not a separation. Nargarjuna would have totally approved of what we were doing. And here's another one where she says, I see a uh, manicured garden, and she described that an hour before it was chosen. And she got all four of those correct. At the end of the program, we see no decline in her, her ability. So in this case, the target is a, is a Berkeley Bevatron, which is a particle accelerator. She said, it looks to me like a belly button energy expander. And here, here's her drawing, and here's what the thing looks like, 50 miles away. And here she said she wants to make it out of clay because it's so complicated. And again, she shows the particle accelerator and the beam tubes going to the target building. And she's, of course, not a technical person. She's a photographer. Um, let's see, we're a little behind. Well, the Army said, we're tired of going to California. Can you train up some of our Army officers to do remote viewing? And we trained six of them, and the six of them were highly significant. The most successful of all was Joe McMonigal, who is still doing remote viewing. His first trial, the target was the Stanford University Art Museum, and he said, I see a building tall in the front and low behind, and made this very nice drawing. Ten years later, working with Ed May, well, this is a different. One of the people couldn't do this, and he always viewed things one day in advance. So, just for completeness, as I was collecting my slides, this fellow said, I want to do a formal trial where the purpose is to describe something you've not yet chosen. So, he said, I see a building that looks like a castle, and there's a big star, five pointed star. That's what I see. Charlie Tard and I then operated a random number generator, got target number 37. 37 turned out to be a Chevrolet dealership with a pointy roof and a big five-pointed star in the window, described perfectly a half hour before it was chosen. Joe McMonigal, at the 10 years later, was asked to describe where a CIA man was located. The guy had gone to the Livermore, Lord's Livermore Atomic Bomb Factory, uh, 100 miles to east of here. He described a six-story T-shaped building covered with glass, which you can see here, and that's where the guy was hiding. 100 miles away on the same day, Joe said, I see him at a hilly situation. There are a bunch of poles connected to a power grid, and this was the ultimate windmill park, 100 miles from here. So what you see is that the reliability and the accuracy can be uh, remarkably successful. Although this, oops. So the question, is this good for anything? After I left SRI, <laughs> it, it's good for many things. You can find your car keys, uh, you can find a parking place, uh, you can make money in the silver market, but my opinion is that the most valuable thing you can do with this is discover who you are. Because after sitting in the dark for a decade, it became clear to me that the people I'm working with could not be just the meat and potatoes as they appear. 
but they must have this timeless awareness that they're manifesting. And of course, the Buddhists throughout time said that who you are is timeless awareness. You can move through your suffering ego into the spacious, timeless awareness, which is who you really are. And that's my invitation for you to explore. But right after leaving SRI, I thought I would explore something different. And we thought we would forecast changes in the silver commodity market. And we did this nine weeks in a row, and we were successful nine out of nine times, made $120,000, and we did not publish that in the Engineering Society, <laughs> but rather in the Wall Street Journal, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. They did we make a, did psychics make a killing in the silver market? Now the significance of our work, the effect so-called effect size, and I won't go through the numbers here, but people want to know this is really significant. And the effect size, the significance of the work we did at SRI in our typical experiments, were ten times stronger than the effect size the National Institutes of Health achieved in convincing people to take aspirin to prevent heart attacks. The heart attack experiment was so successful, so strong, that the NIH told people we're going to end the experiment because it's unfair not to give aspirin to the controls. We don't want to deprive the controls of aspirin, so we're going to end the experiment. It's so strong that we've proved the point, and our work was ten times more significant than what they had. So this is not a weak effect. So we published our findings in, the Proceed in Nature magazine and in the Proceedings of the Engineering Society. Uh, this is, shows that other people have repeated our work at uh, Princeton. Uh, the Dean of Engineering, Robert John, did uh, hundreds and hundreds of experiments that were sig significant at odds of 10 to the 10th. That's one in 10 billion over a decade's worth of work. And my final slide is the non-dual part of this that shows that even as you increase the distance, you don't have any decrease in the ability. Looking from uh, local places to places 6,000 miles away, no decrease in accuracy. You look from contemporaneous out to a month, there's no decrease in accuracy. So this indeed is a non-dual, non-local ability. And the proof of this is evidence so strong, be statistically unreasonable to deny it. You may not like it, you may feel that it violates your religion, but as a scientist in a stool of non-duality, you have to admit that something like psychic ability is going on. And I say something like psychic ability because there is no doubt that I am mischaracterizing how it works. We don't know how it works, but there is no doubt at all that it's accurate, reliable, and reproducible. And my invitation to you is that you learn to quiet your mind and incorporate the spacious awareness into your lives. Thank you. And I have to, have to ask the Swami if I have time for any questions. One or two questions? Anything about anything? Yes. Uh, hello. Yeah, given that it was so successful, why did the CIA stop after 25 years? I could imagine they'd want to keep it going. That the little, e little echo, are you asking why did they cancel the program after 25 years? Yes. That was basically canceled for internal political issues. They didn't like having to argue with Congress. They didn't like being teased. The courageous, imaginative people who had started the program all retired. So in order to deal, our, our opposition to carrying this program did not come from the scientists and the government. It came from the fundamental religious people who argued that if this does not come from Jesus, it comes from Satan. Now I know, now that sounds so crazy, 
You have to understand that I wouldn't make something like that up. <clears throat> but, but, that, but that was our problem. And the new people in the CIA decided not to continue dealing. They simply didn't like being teased by their congressional oversight. One more. All right. You choose. Okay. Thank you. It was the same question as you have. So we, I, we have the answer. And um, I must say, it was very interesting, Russell. And Russell Tag is one of the contributors in my book, in the book show, Aspect of Consciousness with the pictures and all. And thank you for that. I, I am so happy for that. Thank you. It's a very direct question. Do you ever, in the future, in remote viewing, see this planet with no human bodies on it? Question, do I ever see this planet with no bodies on it? No, I can, I can tell you confidently, I have not had that experience. Joe McMonagall, who wrote a book about seeing the future, also does not describe a catastrophic ending. There is no doubt that there will be a time when there are no bodies on this planet, when the sun goes nova and everybody gets fried. But what you'd really like to know is that could have happened sometime soon, and I don't know the answer to that. So, as, just as I believe that there is some survival of bodily death, you shouldn't wait to do what you want to do until next lifetime. <laughs> so, so my advice is, do what has to be done now, and don't wait for your reincarnation to do it, or for the end of planetary existence. Do it now, and thank you.